is Julian. Today we're going to be covering Zizek's theory of action over thinking, or thinking over action, I should say. We're going to cover Zizek versus Marx. We're going to cover what is lecture three in the life of the mind. Uh, along the way, we're going to learn about Adam and Eve, we're going to learn, <laughs> which is not going to be too Christian, I promise you. Uh, we're going to learn about different takes on the idea of the Freudian death drive. And we're going to examine why Zizek is a self-characterized, strange Marxist. So if you're joining me for the very first time today, either on Instagram or above on YouTube, hello and welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. This is a weekly series in which every Monday morning I try to launch the week with a one-hour lecture introducing you to some key ideas within continental philosophy and theory, which can be both literary theory, psychoanalytic theory, all kinds of theory, art theory, film theory, etc. Everything that falls under the moniker theory. And this is entirely open access and free. I've been doing it for the past two years. Anybody can join. And if you'd like to support this project, please go to my Patreon, that is www.patreon.com forward slash Jenneline and Julian. You can also find the link in my bio. And as a patron, you can access the audio download for each and every lecture that I have ever recorded. So that's more than 100 lectures that you can access right now. That's four different courses, plus my ebook introduction to Zizek and Lacan called The Useless Precaution. And this is an ebook subscription service. So every three months, the book gets replaced and you have exactly one week left to get that book before the next one drops. So if you'd like to read The Useless Precaution, my introduction to Zizek and Lacan, please head over to www.patreon.com forward slash Jenneline and Julian. And if you're watching on Instagram, I also just want to quickly say that after every lecture, I host a live Q&A on Discord, which is also available in the first tier on my Patreon. So if you'd like to ask me any questions, can be philosophical, can be life questions, can be literally anything, please head over to my Patreon uh, where you can find the link to my Discord. All right, now that I've gotten that out of the way, I do want to say that what makes me super, super happy is that you guys join me from around the world. And I already see some people telling me where they're joining in from. I see South Korea. Hello, South Korea. If you want to make me really happy, I would super appreciate it if you dropped a comment letting me know where you're joining us from. That is honestly the best feeling in the world. Money cannot buy that kind of satisfaction. I see Holland, Huya Morcha, I see Philippines. Uh, I see someone who has to read Bertrand Russell. I commiserate with you. Um, India, hello India, hello Norway on YouTube. North Macedonia, hello Australia. Indonesia, Kuwait, <laughs> it's amazing, it's so beautiful. India, Serbia, Ooh, that sounds cold. Uh, Colombia, hello. Turkey, Maraba, London, good morning. I see you have a new prime minister. Paris, that's amazing. Bonjour. Portland, I was near there recently. Venezuela, Germany, guten Morgen, Deutschland. That sounds weird. No German person would say it that way. Uh, Istanbul, Brooklyn, New York, Finland, Turkey, beautiful. Montenegro, thank you guys so much. I really, really, really appreciate that. Um, this is the most wonderful way for me to start my week in philosophical, theoretical fashion. It is an early Monday morning, it is 8 a.m. And I am so, so grateful that you are here with me. Truly, this means a lot to me. Hello back to Tokyo and Virginia, and also to people on YouTube. Hello, Malaysia. That is absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Um, Lithuania, Chile, beautiful, beautiful, all right. So I'm gonna launch right in. Um, I'm not gonna make it too difficult. We're gonna start pretty easy and accessible, and then we're gonna slowly build it up. If you're joining for the very first time, you don't need to have any background in philosophy or theory. You can really just drop right in. I try to make every lecture stand alone. But of course, it links into a wider series, and the series that we're currently doing is called The Life of the Mind, which is about the idea of self-reflection and the idea of the self-transparent subject. So ideally, you will both learn some actionable information on what it means to self-reflect. And you will also think about the theoretical philosophical tradition that links to the idea of the self-transparent subject, which goes all the way back to the idea of the Cartesian cogito, the idea that you think, therefore you are. Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Um, and the myriad ways in which this idea continues to 
have repercussions within the history of Western thought. All right, so let's begin. I want to start with an idea that there's going to be two things we're going to talk about. I want to talk about Zizek's critique of what he calls pseudo-activity. And I want to link that to essentially what is a debate between Zizek and Marx and why Zizek says that he is a strange Marxist. And then we're going to link that to Milton's Paradise Lost to Adam and Eve and, and a lot of other things along the way. So that's, that's a little foreshadowing of what we're going to be doing. All right, so Slavoj Zizek, noted contrarian, communist, Slovenian philosopher, has described himself as a strange Marxist. Now, of course, some of you might immediately say that all Marxists are somewhat strange, and I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you there. And yet when Zizek says that he is a strange Marxist, he means something very specific. What he means is that he is a so-called death drive Marxist. And if we ever thought about doing merch, I feel like that would be a pretty good hat to wear, a death drive Marxist. So what does it mean to be a death drive Marxist? Well, essentially, the death drive is an idea that Zizek takes from Freud, which Lacan then further adapts. And Zizek is essentially arguing that his take on Marx and on Marxism is thereby psychoanalytic, which is another way of saying, and for those of you who know Zizek, you may already know this, that Zizek wants to be a Marxist, but a Hegelian Marxist, in other words, to go back to Hegel in order to reread Marx and to do this through a psychoanalytic lens. This is essentially, if you will, Zizek's three-punch operation that he repeats in every single book and every single lecture, which is to say, let's take Hegel, let's infuse it with Lacanian psychoanalysis, and let's use that to have a different take on Marx and on Marxism. Now, without wanting to go into details here, I'm gonna to try to build this up slowly for you. First of all, what is the death drive? And what does it mean to be a death drive Marxist? Well, the death drive is an idea that Freud has, which he relates to the notion of trip. And trip is not instinct. Trip, T-R-I-E-B, is not instinct. Instinct is something that you do instinctually, right? It's, the, it's like animals who find their way to exactly the place where they need to procreate, etc. Trip might be translated as drive. And the question is, where does this drive come from? Now, first of all, one of the misinterpretations of the idea of trip or drive is that it is simply a drive towards death. It's like the existentialist thought that Plato already articulated, which is that living is simply dying by increments, that we are all slowly perishing, and that what we experience as life, as moving forward in life, as progress, is simply a slow decline, as it were. Now, that is very existentialist, obviously. That's very dark. And yet the idea of drive, the idea of trip for Freud, isn't dark in that way. It's not to say that we're living and that we're all sort of inching towards death and that what we call life is simply the process of slowly dying. Instead, it's almost the exact opposite. It's to say that there's this peculiar paradox by which what you experience as life, as quote-unquote living in the moment, is always staged as a kind of little death. And I'll explain that in a moment because now we can actually understand why Plato thought of philosophy as the act of learning how to die. And what's important here is that it's not saying I'm preparing myself for death. It's literally the enactment and the staging of death within life itself. Now that's a pretty radical proposition, right? What does it mean to be dead while you're alive? And what Freud is essentially referring to is something that is probably very relatable to you, which is that sometimes you feel most in the moment when you're doing something that seems to take you out of life. It's like the runner's high when you're simply repeating a mechanical motion by which suddenly you seem to experience an innate sense of satisfaction or joy because you're doing something over and over again. It's also why in French, one of the euphemisms for an orgasm is the petit mort or the little death. It's like that moment in which you disappear into your own pleasure. That moment in which you have ceased to exist, as it were. This is also why there's a beautiful scene in the television series Euphoria, where the main character, played by Zendaya, experiences both the pleasure and the pain of taking drugs, right? She doesn't want to take drugs, 
She's desperately miserable taking drugs, and yet she's never been happier than when she disappears into drugs. And the sense of fading away to yourself, somehow feeling alive at the very moment that you are starting to perish, that you are fading. This is something, for example, that um, you can see when it comes to like mountain climbers. Mountain climbers will go up into a mountain literally risking their life and say that they never felt more alive than when they disappeared into the mountain. This feeling of feeling minuscule and thereby somehow connected to life. And on a very basic level, in order to be present, you have to simply exit sometimes, right? That's the whole premise of meditation is that you take a moment of mindfulness, for example, that you allow yourself to breathe, that you become more aware of the things that you would otherwise do automatically. It means you have to put yourself on hold temporarily. You have to put yourself on timeout. Of course, there's a luxury and a privilege that comes with being able to do that, right? That in a sense, being the master of your own time is one of the fundamentals when it comes to self-liberation. Being able to take a moment for yourself. In many ways, and this is something that I agree fundamentally with, for example, with Ancier, the fight for emancipation is the fight for time. Getting to determine what it is that you do with your time. And that can be both existential, i.e. the time that you have here on Earth, but it can also be incremental. It can be what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now. This idea of the death drive, of essentially feeling alive by staging a little death, doesn't have to be a bad thing. Think about how in contemporary culture, going to the gym has become very important for many, many people. It's not just being healthy. It's also saying, I'm gonna take time to go to a place that is dedicated to self-improvement, where I can work on myself. And strictly speaking, lifting weight is like the definition of a rote mechanical movement. There's not a, I mean, there's an art to it, I believe, but at the same time, it is like you are benching yourself by means of bench pressing, if you will. And what Freud is essentially arguing here is that at the heart of life, like the core of life, the secret of the psychoanalytic experience of life, is that we feel most alive when we're doing something that actually, in a way, puts a little stop in our life, that allows us to not feel in our life. There's a beautiful scene in this is a couple of years ago in Bo Burnham's, um, someone needs to remind me, what was Bo Burnham's uh, movie called? The one on Netflix? Inside, thank you. In Bo Burnham's Inside, he says, it's not that I want to off myself. It's that I want to not exist for a moment. That one of the painful things of being alive, and this is something that I experience very strongly, and I wonder if you do too, is that life is really just one thing after the other that you don't really get a break, that it's very hard to clock out from existing, that as soon as you're dropped here on Earth, you're faced with the perpetual struggle of what it means to exist, and that you can find pleasurable distractions in friendship and family and comfort and cooking and reading and writing and doing sport and thinking and being and existing. And yet all of this sometimes feels like a distraction from a larger inevitable horizon that looms, namely your own imminent demise, or perhaps not so imminent demise, but someday. And mankind is thereby burdened, this is obvious and yet very important, burdened with a consciousness of their own mortality. You know that you are going to die someday. Not to trigger a Monday morning existential crisis, but the awareness of being a finite being is central to what it means to be alive. That you are running out of time. In fact, that your time and your attention is the biggest gift that you could give to anybody. Like literally right now, watching this, you are de dedicating time to this interaction, to hopefully thinking and improving upon yourself and, and wanting to understand these ideas. And that is a gift. Like I think it's so important to understand that when people give you time, they are giving you attention. They are giving you a gift. They are giving you the one thing that they have as a non-renewable resource, which is their time and attention. It's also like one of the key maxims within the idea of grace is the notion that attention equals affection. That if you give anything attention for long enough, it becomes beautiful. Like step out into the garden right now and look at a leaf for a moment. And you'll be astonished how when you give that leaf your undivided attention, how beautiful that leaf becomes. It's also why the fight right now the fight online is the fight for your attention. Because the fight for your attention 
is also the fight for the non-renewable resource that can be monetized, which is wild because then you suddenly feel like maybe attention is like the new oil, right? Something that we're just sucking out of the earth in order to make money. And so your attention is valuable. Your attention is the one thing that you have to give that you have a certain amount of. By the way, I appreciate your attention, right? I know that taking the time to listen to these lectures is an investment in that way. And so I believe that giving some, somebody your attention, saying you are worth my time, is an act of grace, an act of love. And that you find beauty within that which you give attention to, whether it's a tree, whether it's a leaf, whether it's really anything. That if you do something small, you might as well do it as if you were doing something great. That attention equals affection, equals grace. It's also why Sartre, the existentialist who was frustrated by this, would get very angry when a leaf fell from the tree. And Sartre would look at the leaf and say, and pick up the leaf and say to himself, why do you exist? Why do you get to have my attention, leaf? Sartre was obsessed with this idea, the idea of purpose, and the idea that the tree seemed to have a purpose, which was to recycle itself every, every year. Now, that aside, we're still talking about the death drive and what it means to be a death drive Marxist. Now, if the death drive is thereby linked to Trieb, the secondary part of this is that Trieb is linked to the, what Freud calls the Wiederholungszwang. And Wiederholungszwang is the drive to repeat or the repetition compulsion. And the repetition compulsion is that we do things over and over again, that in a sense, life is thereby neurotic that in order to live as a human being, you have to be a functioning neurotic. You have to get up every day, you have to brush your teeth, you have to have three meals a day ideally, you have to be able to get enough sleep, etc., etc. You simply repeat things over and over again. And thereby life becomes a process of perpetual repetition. You're doing the same thing pretty much every day. And yet there is a comfort in this repetition, a comfort which we call habit, and that there's this famous line that is misattributed to Aristotle, which you've probably seen floating around on the internet, yet which feels profound, which is the idea that we are what we do every day. And the funny thing is that that slogan is usually used in like a self-help mantra type way, which is to say you have to acquire healthy habits and you have to do them every day consistently, which is not untrue. Obviously, if you do something good, like, I don't know, you do yoga or meditation or something healthy for you and you do it once every blue moon, that's not going to be as good as doing it every day. That one of the pleasures of doing something every day is that you cease to think about it. It just becomes routine. It becomes habit. And so, yes, if you want to improve yourself, adopt healthy habits. That I, I cannot argue with that. And yet, the slogan or the statement that we are what we do every day also has an existential dimension, which is that we cannot be but what we do every day. That to be alive is to exist ceaselessly. And that, of course, is a gift, but it's also something that is slightly horrific if you think about it, that to exist means to constantly be. And that since we are so bad at being, we are thereby forced to become. That becoming, in a sense, is how we tackle the problem of being. That human, human beings, as it were, are fundamentally ill at ease in their own bodies, in their own minds. We are not static. We're not natural. We're not instinctual. Instead, we're tormented. We suffer. We enjoy. We're restless. We're inspired. We're motivated. We want to live. We don't want to die. We want to love. And this restless energy that we experience is the very heart of what it means to be alive. This kind of perpetual dissatisfaction this inability to be and the desire to become. It's also why last week in the lecture I used that Schlegel line where Schlegel said that you cannot be a philosopher, you can only become a philosopher, and that could also be applied to pretty much everything in life. You can't be something, you can only become it. You cannot be a mother or a father, you can only become a mother or a father. That life is an act of becoming from the moment that you are alive. It's also why the existential premise that Sartre has is that life is two things. One, life is what you choose to do. But more importantly, life is what you choose to do with what others have done to you. And for Sartre, this begins when you were born because you didn't choose to, to exist. You didn't choose to be born. And so what you experience as your being is in fact disguised becoming. That 
becoming is your predicament, that you can become or other people can make you. And that, in fact, there is no clear distinction, that you are constantly trying to become something which you are not or which you were not. And yet this is also the joyful proposition of life. Okay, so far so intuitive, right? I don't think that this is something that like you need to have a degree for to have experienced. It's also why, like I said before, Bo Burnham said that he didn't want to off himself. He simply wanted to push the off button on life. And there's many ways in which we do this. There's many ways in which we feel like we're relinquishing the burden of existence. One of them can be subject to somebody else to provide service. For example, to take care of a child or a friend or a loved one, to say, I am here for you. This is also why the word subject is thereby duplicitous. You are both subject because it is your subjective agency and you'd be, you become subject to somebody that by means of loving someone and by means of becoming vulnerable to them, you have become subject. That in a, in a strange sense, subjectivity can never be reached a priori or naturally. You can't simply be, you become. And how do you become? You become by being towards others, being in a relationship, being in a family, being part of a country, being of service to others. That is how you discover yourself. Okay, so all of this aside, I wanna take this idea of the death drive that we've already identified here, right? The death drive being the innate paradox within life itself that we experience life as not just the process towards death, but as the enactment of a certain type of little death within ourselves by means of which we feel like we exist. Being subject to something, a higher self or a religion or a family or a loved one that in a sense, we have to make ourselves vulnerable. We have to be subject to in order to experience subjectivity. And this idea is then for Zizek, death drive Marxism. So what does it mean to be a death drive Marxist? Let's return to this question. Well, for Zizek to be a death drive Marxist can basically be summed up in the following terms. You may have heard Marx's relatively famous dictum that it's not enough not enough for the philosophers of the world to think the world. Instead, the goal has to be to change it. It's not enough to think the world, the goal has to be to change it. You could say that this is the beginning of Marx's theory of revolution, right? The idea being that you have to change the world, and not just think it. Of course, you will immediately see how this idea of changing the world has become adopted within the kind of ideology of Silicon Valley tech optimism, the notion that you have to be the change in the world and your company has to change the world and that unless your company has a mission statement by which you explain in bullet points how you are making a difference, you cannot be the difference, etc. That the very idea of change, of course, is being commodified and co-opted into a kind of slogan that companies use. Anything that you buy today will tell you how they're changing the world or how they're contributing to the world. And this doesn't have to be a bad thing. Of course, we want to have some incentive structures for companies to be more quote unquote ethical. And yet fundamentally this type of change, changing the world through consumptive practices, changing the world by using an app that allows you to find a parking space, etc., it doesn't really change the world. It doesn't really disrupt. Instead, it simply facilitates the world. It allows the world to continue functioning slightly more seamlessly and perhaps also for you to be more integrated into an, inter like an online network by which your data also becomes part of a commodified substance for those companies. And so what is presented to you as you are part of changing the world is also simply a, an, an unspoken commitment by which you give data to companies and that they sell your data against advertisements, usually. Now, Marx has the idea, to go back to Marx, Marx says, it's not enough to think the world, we have to change it. Zizek has a counterpoint to Marx, whereby he says, it's not enough to change the world, we have to think the world. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can interpret this, and we can rank them according to like more serious levels of theoretical engagement. The most obvious common sense way to interpret Zizek's counterpoint to Marx, that we have to think, not act, is to say that we should take a step back. That it's important to have action, and yet it's more important to have considered action. That the manner in which we act is more important than action itself. In fact, that the ideology of action above all is often reactionary. 
is often proto-fascist, anti-intellectualizing, that action is considered part of what the strong do and thinking is part of what the weak do, etc. This kind of warrior mindset that idolizes action as the sign of virtue and strength and thought thereby being the absence or lack of, of, I don't know, muscle or skill or power or whatever. That is the most obvious interpretation, right? Zizek is simply saying, let us think more before we act. But there's a second level and there's a third level and we can unpack those slowly. The second level is to say that acting often doesn't really mean acting. It's what Zizek calls pseudo-activity. That a lot of activity masks inactivity. Everybody will have experienced this, right? It's like if you have, if you have an assignment at work or in school, suddenly you become very productive when it comes to cleaning your room. It's like instead of doing the thing you're supposed to be doing, you're cleaning your room or you're going for a walk or you're calling your friend. It's like you're doing a lot of things because you're trying to avoid the one thing that you should be doing. And this, this is in a sense a kind of hysterical energy. It's doing a lot of things so as not to have to do something. It's like you're staving off the actual action by means of pseudo activity. Happens to everybody, happens to me all the time. Like there's something I have to do and instead I decide that it's the perfect time to clean out the fridge. And this pseudo activity isn't just on an individual level. It can happen within corporations that one way in which you can look important at work is to create a lot of work, to make life harder than it needs to be, to create more problems so that it then can appear like you are the one solving them. This is also what David Graeber, RIP, referred to as bullshit jobs. He said bullshit jobs tend to be white collar jobs where problems are created in order to have more people who can solve them, more accountants, more lawyers, etc. that a company becomes more valuable the more complicated it becomes. And that you end up with job titles where people don't really know exactly what they're doing. It's just like mission creep, if you will. It's also why the designer Karl Lagerfeld said that the one person he didn't like working with was somebody who thought that they looked more professional by creating more problems. And so efficiency is key to action. We can all agree, key to productivity. And yet what happens very quickly is that we create more work for ourselves because it feels like we're doing something. Like if you figure out a way of doing something so smart that it becomes easy, you almost start wondering, wait, maybe this is too easy. Maybe I should be working more. That we create more work than is needed almost as a way to validate ourselves and as a way to avoid other things. And this idea of pseudo activity is of course key within the ideology of consumerism, which of course is the ideology of capitalism, of sustained consumption, of sustained and manufactured desire. What is Nike's logo? Just do it. Here we have action over thought. Should I do this? I don't know, just do it. The incentive to simply act is thereby perfectly pitched for the incentive structure that will make you a consumer, somebody who simply buys. Don't think about whether or not you can afford this new iPhone, just buy it. Don't think about whether or not this home is actually going to be a good investment for you and your family, just buy it. The imperative to act is thereby the imperative to keep on desiring, to keep on participating within the desire economy. And that it's almost like if you don't participate within the desire economy, you cease to exist. There's literally an ad for one of the new iPhones, I believe, could be a different phone, where a customer comes to return his old phone to get the new one. And he walks into the store, AT&T or something. He walks into the store and when he shows the saleswoman his phone, she gasps and children are made to avert their eyes because the phone that he is handing in is so old that it's considered vulgar, that his, that his own phone is so old that he's trading in that people literally cannot look. It's like he has become scum of the earth because he has an old phone. It's ridiculous, of course, that an advertisement would be pressuring you into feeling fearful of public interactions because your phone might not be of the latest generation. 
And so this fear of missing out, this perpetual cycle of desire and manufactured desire, is part of the relentless drive of capitalism. If you will, it is the death drive within capitalism. I exist because I consume. Not I think, therefore I am. I act, therefore I am. And what is the ultimate pseudo-activity? The ultimate pseudo-activity is I buy, therefore I am. I consume, therefore I am. I have the latest car, the latest phone, the latest outfit. And this perpetual sense of needing more in order to feel like you have lived is of course something that remains perpetually unsatisfying. Which, and let me be very clear, I'm not saying that you shouldn't express yourself. Of course, enjoy clothes, enjoy fashion, enjoy good food, enjoy good company, enjoy spending money that you've earned. And yet the perpetual process by which we are told to keep buying things, things that most of us cannot even afford and we're trying to impress other people, that is the death drive within the consumer society, saying, don't think about this purchase, act on this purchase. It's also why, like I said, Nike's slogan is, just do it. And so that's the secondary level, right? Zizek essentially has three levels of critique when it comes to his rejoinder to Marx. Marx says, it's not enough to think the world, we have to change it. Zizek says, no, we actually have to think the world before we change it. And so the first level is to say, take a step back. Think about your actions. The second level is to say that pseudo-activity, which is a human, a human behavior, is actually at the heart of consumerism and capitalism. The idea that Consuming things as an imperative of just doing it becomes a substitute for the expression of what it means to live a life. That we are because we buy, essentially. Now the third level that is a little bit more complicated, where it starts getting a bit more theoretical, actually has to do with the fact that Zizek doesn't believe that thinking and acting are antithetical. In fact, if you follow the argument so far, Namely, that most action is simply pseudo-action, right? Someone in the comments actually caught my eye because said reification moment, and you're right, this is exactly what reification is. Thank you, that's very good. I'm gonna re-articulate my argument. Sorry for getting distracted, I just thought that was such a good comment. Um, okay, if you follow into Zizek's argument, which is that most activity is pseudo-activity, then you realize, well, if most action is simply inaction, then maybe action and thinking aren't antithetical. Maybe it's not either you're thinking or you're acting. Maybe if action is pseudo-activity, then what if thinking can be a form of action? In other words, what if action masks inaction and thought is masking action? Of course, you could say the more intuitive way would be to say, well, maybe thinking masks um, masks pseudo-thinking, right? Which is also true, that there are ways in which we can fret and we can think that don't really contribute to anything. If you simply go and sit in the corner of a room to think by yourself, it's unlikely that you will come up with something particularly meaningful. In fact, this is where I really like Neil Gaiman's advice when it comes to writing or doing anything creative. Neil Gaiman, the author, said that when he wants to write, he simply gives himself two options. He says, either you can write or you can do nothing. And the trick is that it is actually very hard for human beings to do nothing for a sustained period of time. It's like, you're not allowed to look at your phone, you're not allowed to read a book, you're not allowed to listen to music, you just do nothing. And Neil Gaiman basically says that if you do nothing for long enough, you want to do something. You start coming up with ideas and narratives, etc. He says before he knows it, he goes from not wanting to write to suddenly wanting to write, simply because he had to bear doing nothing for a while. Of course, it sounds a bit privileged. I mean, poor Neil Gaiman who has to bear doing nothing. But the point is that in order to properly act, you have to allow yourself the contrast of not acting. That so much of what we're doing on the side is pseudo activity. It's like when you're on your phone, it's not really because you want to be on your phone. You don't want to keep scrolling. You're stuck in a loop. And that is preventing you from doing something. That's preventing you from writing a book or taking a degree or going to the gym or anything that you really want to do. And here we find the death drive reenacted within the phone. Think about it, like what is TikTok other than digitized death drive? Oh, one more video, one more video, one more video. You're constantly looking for the next little high, the next little serotonin boost that you're gonna get. And 
Our human brains, I don't believe, are designed to experience this, where you go from joy to revulsion to anger to frustration to being turned on by a thirst trap, all within the succession of like my, like seconds. And it leaves us feeling empty inside, I believe, because deep down we know that it's pseudo life, that it's not real emotion. It's simply the simulation or the simulacra of sustained repetitive emotions. And yet it is pleasurable, undeniably, otherwise we wouldn't do it so much. It's pleasurable to stop life and to let ourselves be flooded by other lives for a moment. And so the ultimate pseudo activity today is being online. It's constantly doing things online, constantly consuming, constantly trying to have to keep up, feeling like you cannot take a moment away from it because your eyeballs are literally glued to it. It is changing our consciousness. But we can put that aside for a moment. The point being that for Zizek, if action, being on the internet, buying things, etc., is pseudo activity, then perhaps thinking is an act, an act of resistance. That when you take a step back, when you reflect, when you read a book, when you think, when you articulate your thoughts, when you journal, when you try to make sense of that which is going through your mind, when you reflect on the way in which the chaos inside of you mirrors the, mirrors the chaos inside of everybody else, that process of reflection, of thinking, thereby suddenly becomes an act of resistance. That not acting, choosing not to do something, becomes an act. And what is thinking, if not the act of choosing not to do something? This is literally like if you go back to Plato's Academy, the reason the Academy was created was to solve a problem, which is where do you go to think? It seems so obvious, right? Where do you go to think? But it's like, let, imagine for a moment that there were no places in which you could publicly slow down, read a book, have a discussion, an argument. That is what civic society is, right? You go to a cafe, you can read a newspaper, you can talk to your friends, you walk on the street, you can say hello. There are so many ways in which what it means to be alive is to have that experience of communal reflection. We go to the movies, we go to the theater, we go to the park to watch other people participate in the theater of society. That is what it means to take a moment to reflect. And so when Plato, and of course we're talking here about Socrates, but when the Socratic Academy, the Platonic Academy was started, it was to solve a problem, which is the problem of where do we find a space to think? And that is the privilege of university, right? It is a genuine privilege to pay money to go somewhere where for a couple of years, you don't have to really prove yourself. It's okay to think, to study, to read, to write. Of course, many people have a job on the side, right? Which is a good thing. It's good to work and to hone your skills and build up your CV, but like creating and carving out space to think should never stop, no matter how old you are. Finding time to reflect, finding time to read, to watch movies, to laugh and cry with others, like that becomes an act of resistance. Think about how much time you spend doing nothing actively. Like, think about how much time in your life you dedicate to your phone or to a web page or to just doing things that feel overwhelming and yet don't really accomplish anything. And now think about how good it would be for you to simply allow yourself to do nothing. Thereby doing nothing suddenly becomes an act of resistance. It becomes a little escape. And this is also how you have to understand Zizek's take on Bartleby the Scribner. Namely, when Zizek says, essentially, I mean, essentially what Zizek is saying, I, I don't know how much I have to introduce this. I'm going to actually introduce this for, as, if no, as if nobody had. So Bartleby the Scribner is a, is a character who essentially is working a job, and uh, he says, I would prefer not to. He simply starts saying, I would prefer not to. And Zizek essentially takes this idea of, I would prefer not. And he makes this into like a slogan of resistance. Simply to opt out, to not do, 
to essentially say, I would prefer not to, to not be a yes man, to not just do it, to allow yourself to not. And that this is actually like surprisingly key when it comes to redefining and articulating what it is you want to be doing to be able to opt out. Of course, for Zizek, this is also part of a revolutionary theory that if enough people opted out, we would thereby have collective resistance. That if we decided that we didn't have to do something, we would be able to start solving actual problems. That pseudo activity is to say, buy an electric car, save the planet. Start recycling, save the planet. That we individualize collective problems and turn them into consumptive patterns. And that this idea of masking the inevitable reality of, for example, climate change by means of ethical consumption and individual practices that are supposed to make you feel better, that this is exactly how we end up in a problem. And this is also why Zizek says, for example, that like even something as good as eating organic food is part of this. That we find band-aids that don't really solve the problem. Of course, that seems harsh, right? Because like, better to do something than nothing, right? And yet Zizek's argument here is actually an argument that relates to the existentialist notion of mauvaise foi, or false consciousness. And this is where you have to see a link again for Marx and the existentialists. Marx had this idea, for they know not what they do. That is part of reification, part of the commodity fetish, that people act in a way, but they simply don't know better. The innovation from the existentialists when it came to false consciousness was to say, no, people know exactly what they're doing, and yet they continue to do it, and yet they persist. We know that what we're doing isn't sustainable, and yet we continue to do it. Of course, opting out can become a reactionary fantasy. If you decide that you're a survivalist and you're going to live on a mountain by yourself and build your own septic tank, etc., good for you. That's not going to help. And so the fantasy of escape, individual escape, is not the solution either. In fact, if you think about it, there's this whole identity, especially within the American right, which is predicated on survivalism and individualism and that when the apocalypse comes that you will be able to protect your family, etc. Build a bunker. And that wouldn't be life. And then you realize here we have another version of pseudo-activity, that this relentless bunkering up, buying water and toilet paper, etc., is the definition of pseudo-activity. Doing something to deal with your anxiety that is not going to solve anything. Now the question, of course, that you ask yourself at this point is, well, what do we do? If opting out isn't enough, and yet doing nothing seems like a minimal act of resistance, surely that can't help. Surely simply saying, I quit, isn't going to do anything. And so what Zizek is saying isn't that you should simply give up. In fact, Zizek is very explicit about the fact that he's not a cynic. Cynicism is, in fact, something that happens within people who, who are precisely pseudo-acting. Like, cynicism is a way for you to feel better than everybody else. It's like you're doing something, but you've already given up on it. It's like, I've seen through it. And Jizek says that cynicism should never be your guiding light. Instead, this is how we finally get back to Zizek versus Marx and why Zizek is a death drive Marxist. Zizek says, the way you change the world is by thinking the world. That if you reflect on the coordinates of the manner in which incentive structures are created in life, in other words, how power works, you already have resisted. Think about, for example, a protest movement, a protest movement that doesn't articulate its demands, thereby cannot, strictly speaking, be successful in any normative sense. If a protest movement doesn't have a leader, who do you talk to? If a protest movement doesn't have one clearly articulated demand, what can they achieve? And yet this is precisely their achievement, to make everybody else scratch their heads and say, what, it is, that, what is it that you are trying to achieve? The answer is nothing. Trying to create awareness, trying to expose a problem, 
trying to halt and slow down. If you look at, for example, the Gezi Park protests in 2013 in Turkey, one of the most iconic protesters was called the Standing Man. And he did nothing except stand. He simply stood, he stopped. And suddenly his stopping, his inaction became a form of action. That's when you realize that what the Turkish government feared the most was if everybody stopped doing what they were doing. That as long as everybody kept participating in a kind of manic activity, that everything was just fine, even protests, but that inactivity was the real threat. That power is innately and inherently anti-intellectual because, because intellect questions power. And that thereby the act of ceasing to act and thinking becomes a threat. That this is why books were burned and ideas are repressed. That as soon as you can convince people to stop thinking, you have taken away their power. And this is why we keep pushing action on people. Because the more we push action on people, the less likely they are to think about their actions. And the powerful know full well how dangerous thought is. Because thought never happens in isolation. You can't think anything by yourself. You think it with others. You start making connections. You start reading and understanding ideas and you start discussing them with other people and you start congregating, you start questioning. That to think is to critique. And thereby the best way to make people to stop thinking, which by the way is a great way to make people stop feeling, is to tell people that unless they act, they don't exist. That you are because you act. And this anti-intellectual trend to vilify and demonize thought is thereby a way of restricting expression, of making it harder for people to actually do something. And you'll, you'll be surprised like how perpetuated this idea is that thinking is a waste of time, that doing anything related to thought, whether it's reading or art or writing, is wasted time. And yet, could you think of time that is wasted better? It is time wasted well, if you will. Okay, so here we have this idea already, right? Where Zizek says that he is a death drive Marxist, which is another way of saying that he's pointing out, pointing out the fact that there is pseudo activity within Marxism, which stages a kind of death drive, which mirrors a death drive which in, within the human being, which thereby has to be repressed or not acknowledged. In other words, that one way of not existing is simply to continue to act, to continue to buy, to continue to participate within the incentive structure of the ideology of a consumer society, which Marx referred to as bourgeois ideology. And this is why Zizek says that we have to think instead of acting. However, Zizek is not just saying we have to think before we act, he's also thinking, saying that thinking is a form of acting. In this sense, he's building on the theorist Louis Althusser, who argued that theory and practice were not opposed, but that theory was itself a kind of practice. But we'll cover that in another class. Now, I wanna, I wanna link this, because we still have a little bit of time. I may have bitten off more than I can chew here. We can do that in, we can do that in the q and I wanna link this to an idea, because I wanna, exp I wanna finish with Adam and Eve, and I wanna finish with why Zizek is a Hegelian strange Marxist. So I'm gonna try to compress this. Hegel has a really interesting take. Let's see if we can do this in 10 minutes. Hegel has a really interesting take on paradise. Hegel says that paradise is simply code for instinct, for acting like an animal. That in paradise, everyone acted instinctually. That there was animalistic life. In other words, there was no drive. There was simply being. No becoming, just being and that thereby paradise isn't just code for animal life, but that paradise and the idea of the heavenly gardens of Eden emerges only after the fall. In other words, that paradise is essentially a concept that human beings experience because they no longer have access to being, they are stuck in becoming. Now take a minute to process that idea because it's quite interesting because in a sense, when Adam eats of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, he, he becomes self-aware. He receives self-consciousness. 
and self-consciousness thereby places him outside of the animal kingdom. And now the animal kingdom becomes the fantasy, the ultimate place that Adam wishes to be reunited with. That after the fall from heaven, human beings are out of joint, both with the world and within themselves. That we have here, if you will, the death drive, that the apple is the death drive. That human beings are now perpetually stuck in becoming. They no longer have access to being as being. And here we can make a really interesting link to Milton's Paradise Lost. There's a famous passage in Milton's Paradise Lost where Adam and Eve, both having eaten of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, having gained self-consciousness and self-awareness, they are acting, right? They have started to act, to do things. In other words, to not simply be, but to become. And in this passage, Adam looks up into the heavens. Essentially, Adam is existentially pondering. He is thinking about his existence. He is thinking. Eve, on the other hand, looks into a pool of water and sees her own reflection and gazes into it. Now, a commonplace sexist interpretation of this passage is to say, Milton is saying that Adam, i.e. the man, is the thinker. Adam is the intellectual. Eve is the narcissist. While Adam is contemplating worldly domination, Eve is simply looking at her hair. And what I want to argue is that nothing could be less true. It is the exact opposite. And here's why. First of all, let's start with a outrageous, provocative, controversial argument. What if God is a narcissist? By which I mean, isn't God in the Christian doctrine simply the one who loves his creation like himself? Is not God thereby a narcissist? God loves humanity as an extension of himself? Yes and no. Let me explain. In order to understand whether or not God is a narcissist, which I do not believe that he is, we have to understand the reading of Eve looking into the pool. Now, the classic sexist approach is to say, if Eve is looking into the pool at her own reflection, Eve is thereby a narcissist, right? It's the narcissist looking into the pool, falling in love with his own reflection, falling into it and dying. And yet, what if Eve, because I believe that this is Milton's true intent, what if Eve, when she looks into the pool, into her own reflection, is actually mirroring what has just happened to Eve? Think about it. Eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge is the process of self-consciousness, is the process of becoming self-aware. Namely, who am I to myself and to others? I no longer fit in. And so Eve is looking into the pool of water because she is now faced with her own reflection, which mirrors, and this is the technical component, which mirrors the fall itself. Think about it. If God has paradise, he doesn't have human subjective consciousness. There's simply being. There's no becoming as of yet. In order to actualize into humans, into the community of the faithful, into religion, man has to fall. There is no faith within paradise because there is no sin within paradise. The fall is what creates faith. The, the fall is what creates God. The fall is what creates heaven and paradise. That God, like Eve, is looking into the pool of his own reflection and thereby seeing himself for the first time. That mankind, in its fall, in seeing itself, God sees himself. That human being subjectivity is how God sees God. That what Eve is doing when she looks into the pool after eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, she is seeing herself refracted 
in the way that God would see himself refracted through Eve. It's also like when Adam eats of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, the idea is, do you want to have my knowledge? God literally says to Adam, you know what I know. In other words, it's Adam has become like God. This is Zizek's argument about God, that God isn't sublime and perfect and ideal and happy, that God is tormented, that God is split, that God is out of joint. And the way in which God is out of joint is expressed through humanity being out of joint. And so Hegel's argument is that paradise thereby only exists for man who has fallen from paradise. That man who now exists in the world of drive, in the, in the world of not being united, is thereby out of joint. And that this out of jointness equals human consciousness. And that thereby the desire to be reunited with something that makes you not out of joint is the desire to not exist, to be in heaven. Now you can understand that when Adam is looking up into the skies, Adam is the one who isn't being the intellectual. It's the opposite. Adam is being the transcendentalist. Adam wants to be reunited with the unity of being that existed only in paradise, with his animalistic nature. It's almost like Adam is foreshadowing the masculinity cult that says that we should all be tribal and live like cavemen. Adam wants to go back to animal life. Eve is much more sophisticated. Eve understands that she now is her own image, that she exists refracted, and thereby Eve becomes the agent of drive, the agent of becoming, and Adam becomes the agent of yearning, of a transcendental desire. And if you think about it that way, we have a very different reading from the traditional one. The traditional one being Adam, Adam is the thinker, the intellectual. Eve is the narcissist who simply ponders her own reflection. And if you read it through a Hegelian lens, you understand that it is almost the exact opposite, that Adam is the transcendentalist who wants to be reunited with an impossible, possible unity of being that simply cannot exist except refracted through the lens of his own desire, which is the desire of the coming. And that it is Eve who properly understands what is thereby almost a foreshadowing of a postmodern problem of the refracted existence of her own image, which thereby is the refractive image of God to himself. And this is Hegel's take on Christianity, which is that God has to fall in Christ. That essence appears not before the fall, but afterwards. Paradise appears only once Adam has fallen. That animalistic nature, being in nature, is not paradise. Paradise is what it looks like from afar. And that thereby the idea of paradise exists precisely within man, within man's own out of jointness. And this is something we can talk about in some of the other classes. But there's a philosophical metaphysical proposition here, which is that the goal of life and the goal of thought is thereby no longer transcendental. It's no longer wanting to be reunited with the Godhead, going back to purity or comfort or simply existing. But that the metaphysical question now becomes not transcendence, but post-metaphysical. Namely, what does it mean for the transcendent to have transcended himself? And this is essentially what we see staged within the idea of the crucifixion for Hegel. That it is not that Christ comes to earth to prove the existence of God, but Christ comes to earth to fail in the incentive structures of the existing orders and thereby precisely to succeed. That Christ's revolution is not a revolution of action, it is a revolution of inaction. That Christ on the cross repeats the standing man at the Gezi protest the man outside of the incentive structure of power, the man who simply is the man who stops. And that this is thereby a revolutionary act. And now you can understand why for Marx, revolution isn't simply picking up weapons and fighting against power. Revolution starts within. And that may sound like a mantra, but what it means is that revolution is simply a change in consciousness. That to revolve, to have a revolution, isn't to change the world, but it is to change yourself. However, here I need to end on something very important. 
we're back at Zizek's Pluto activity. Most thinkers, for example, Jordan Peterson, will say something like, don't try to change the world's problems before you've changed yourself. Here we have pseudo activity. Doesn't have to be a bad thing, it's good to work on self-improvement, but the more you individualize your change, the less likely you are to ever understand the collective conditions by which change has to be achieved. In other words, that there are myriad problems in the world that simply cannot be solved on the individual level. In fact, that the powerful will remain powerful and the rich will remain rich as long as they convince you that all you have to do is focus on yourself and tend to your own wounds and your own family and make a little bit more money, etc. That the drive to individually take care of yourself means that the collective problems will never be solved. Which isn't to say that you shouldn't work on yourself, which isn't to say that many people aren't struggling and that we should respect their struggle, but that the axis of orientation is thereby placed on the individual, which also means that the axis of blame can be placed on the individual. That you then, having become the agent of your own success, will be condemned for not successfully, successfully doing so. That the old pulling yourself by your bootstraps argument is simply a way of placing the blame on the individual. Saying, you didn't work hard enough. You didn't focus on yourself enough. You didn't achieve anything. And so you are not deserving. That we essentially are ethically condemning people to poverty because we have convinced them that they have to be their own heroes. That to collectively do something is to look for a handout and so on and so forth. That is the reactionary kernel within what, within what would otherwise be a totally good thing to tell somebody, which is work on yourself. And so Zizek's argument is thereby that once you realize that this type of normative advice contains an ideological kernel, which is that by working only on yourself, you thereby have condemned yourself, this argument that Zizek is making can only be articulated in thought. And of course, it seems cruel. Why would you tell somebody who's trying to make something out of their life that they shouldn't clean their room or that they shouldn't make a good investment, or that they shouldn't get up and shave and go to work. It seems like punching down. And what Zizek is trying to argue instead is that the big problems in life cannot be solved individually. They can only be solved collectively. And that by telling people to act for themselves, we are actually telling people to never realize that they are a collective. That if you have an army of ants and you tell each of their each of those ants that they are a hero, the ants will never realize that they vastly outnumber the crickets, to take the metaphor from the movie Ant, what is it, Ant Life, something, whatever. And here we have staged again this very idea that you can trace back to Adam and Eve. Adam looking into the sky, wanting to be reunited with his ancestral tenants, his nine tenants, is thereby the sucker. Eve, the supposed narcissist, is the one who has stopped to reflect, literally, about her appearance and her reflection to herself of being in the world, of giving up on the impossible dream of returning to paradise. And thereby, Eve is the emancipatory subject. Thereby, Eve is the one who realizes the gaze, that she has become the materialized gaze of God. And Adam is the reactionary fantasist who's being told that he has to clean up his room so that he can go back to heaven. That is the distinction between Adam and Eve. And thereby, Eve is a beautiful narcissist in the exact way that God is a beautiful narcissist. The realization of, I mean, first of all, I just wanna say, narcissism is such a loaded word within clinical therapy that maybe we should take this word out here. But the point is that Eve, admiring her own self-reflection, understands the predicament that she is split from within, that she is refracted in the same manner that God is refracted. And that understanding this split is what Zizek calls death drive Marxism. That death drive Marxism understands that revolutionary consciousness is not fighting against. In other words, it's not an act. It is understanding how you are being sold pseudo activity as a means of making yourself be powerless, that you are sold the idea of individual enrichment of power precisely as a means to make you less powerful, that 
this idea of the emancipated subject thereby always has to come with the realization that you are the collective subject, that you are not the individual subject, that it is not eat or be eaten. And so inactivity suddenly emerges not as the solution, but as the articulation of a problem, that the standing man or Christ on the cross becomes a marker of this differing revolutionary consciousness. And not just a marker, but a martyr. Somebody who symbolizes the way in which most activity simply masks inactivity. And that there is something powerful in that. Remember, the Marxist idea about revolution is that revolution is class consciousness. And what Marx means is that the working class, which for, which for Marx was the revolutionary class, is the revolutionary class because it is not fighting for its rights. It is fighting to no longer exist. That the definition of what it means to have a revolution is to eliminate the working class. Like, what interest group is advocating on behalf of its own elimination? That is the working class because without capitalism, the working class wouldn't exist. And without selling the working class the idea of individualized self-enrichment, capitalism could no longer pull the wool over everybody's eyes by telling them that you are your own agent of riches and success. And that thereby, the very counterintuitive proposition for Marx is that class consciousness equals no longer wanting to have class. Class. In other words, that the working class is the only class that is advocating on behalf of its own elimination. And thereby you can see how Zizek makes the argument about death drive Marxism. That the very idea of moving up the ladder, of having class advancement, thereby feeds into the impossibility of such advancement. That the rich are perfectly happy to have one individual who becomes wealthy as long as the vast majority remain an impoverized workforce. That the dream of liberation is thereby the very way in which oppression is sold to you. Whereas Nietzsche said that the best way to keep a man in chains is to convince him that he is free. And now you understand why Marx would insist that all you have to lose is your chains. Because once you have lost your chains, you have lost everything else. We'll talk about this in the Q&A, but there's a beautiful passage in Tristan and Isolde, Wagner's opera, in which we have exactly, exactly this Marxist idea foreshadowed within Wagner's Tristan. And so the argument that Zizek makes to wrap up, because I know we've gone long, is that it's not that you should think before you act, but that thinking is a form of acting. And that in order to realize thought as action, you have to opt out. And thereby opting out becomes a form of activity that opting out is an act of resistance, that by refusing to be a yes man, by refusing to be part and parcel of the desire economy and manufactured consumer interests, that you have taken the very first step towards genuine emancipation, and that that is the most courageous thing that you can do. And thereby, it shouldn't be you should think instead of act, but that thinking is the precondition to all genuine action. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. All right, that went long. That was 70 minutes. I apologize. Um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for listening to this. Thank you for giving me your attention. I appreciate that. Um, being able to start the week out in philosophical, theoretical, like-minded fashion is so enriching to me. I find it so incredibly enjoyable. I am so grateful that you are here. If you would like to download this lecture and every lecture that I've recorded, you can find all of that on my Patreon. The Patreon is what financially keeps this project going. If you'd like to support the project, if you'd like to download all of my lectures and my ebook, which is available for one more week, please go to www.patreon.com forward slash Jenneline and Julian. That is www.patreon.com forward slash Jenneline and Julian. You can also find the link in my bio. Of course, these lectures are open access and free and they will always be free. There will never be a paywall for any of this content because I believe that education should be free. So thank you for being here. Thank you for participating in this learning community. I love you guys all so much. I'm gonna be hosting a live Q&A discussion right now on Discord for our learning community members on Patreon. If you'd like to join that Q&A and download the Q&A as a bonus podcast, one more time, 
please go to www.patreon.com forward slash Jenneline and Julian. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you and thank you for being a part of this learning community. All right. See you guys next week. Bye-bye. And thank you everybody on YouTube as well. I know I don't make eye contact with you, but I know you're here. Bye guys.